2 uh, Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. We are learning about God's grace manifested. His grace is sufficient. Let me get to where we're going this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, let's pick it up in verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. That verse is going to end up in the morning message this morning. It's pretty neat uh, how God worked it out. Because we're studying uh, in, the, in the sermons, we've been looking at the threefold chord. And here Paul says he besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Uh, verse 9, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Open up there. And um, we gave the definitions, to both the Bible and the dictionary definitions for the word grace. And it is where God gives us uh, His mercy for free. He gives us justification for free. He gives us salvation for free does not require a work or a payment or any, any sort of thing like that, does not require that out of us. There is, however, a biblical requirement for salvation on our part. And what is that requirement? Huh? Faith, belief, trust. You believe God's word. You believe what he said. And if it's not God's word, how would you know it's from God? Amen. So it's believe and trust in God's word. Uh, Peter said we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So now let's look at the first place in the Bible where grace is manifested. Let's get the story. Uh, Genesis. I had you Genesis three, but let's look at Genesis chapter two. Very quick. Lee. Very quickly, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, The Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And you could say that even at there, God is giving Adam everything in the garden to eat absolutely for free. At this time, Adam does not have to maintain the garden. He does not have to plow. He does not have to till. Does not have to sow. Does not have to do anything. Everything that's there in the garden is given to Adam absolutely free. So it could be said that God's grace was manifested here. Uh, but then he says in verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So in here we have basically the, we're, we're going to see the manifestation of God's grace. But here we see the manifestation of the law. God places mankind down here and then he gives him one restriction only. Only one restriction. Does not say anything about anything else anywhere in the world. Except for this one tree. Didn't say that he couldn't climb the tree. Didn't say that he couldn't look at the tree. He just said you cannot. Didn't say you couldn't touch the tree or the fruit of the tree. He just said you cannot eat of the fruit of that particular tree. So in here we have the manifestation of God's commandments or God's law. 
Um, I've mentioned this before, but I decided one day to count the words that God said from verses 16 to verse 17. There's exactly 39 words here, which that's how many books there are in the law. So you have a manifestation, a prototype of the law here given to us. So then chapter three, we know the serpent more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, yea, if God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. My wife and I had a conversation one time after church going home. And she asked me when I thought Eve was made or created. Was she created on day six of creation with Adam? Or was she made sometime after that? So I'd be interested in hearing your response on that. Was Eve made on day six with Adam? Or was Eve made sometime after that? After, let's say, after day six, we know that God rested on the Sabbath day, so we didn't do anything on that day. So when was Eve made? When was she created? Huh? With Adam? On day six. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Had not thought of it that way. Day nine. Day nine? So that would be Tuesday? Monday. <laughs> Monday. Monday morning. Who else has an opinion, an idea? Do what? In the evening of the sixth day. Since her name was Eve. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Oh, you want to hear from me? All right. If you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Uh, if you look at verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Then if you look in the beginning of chapter two, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So, we have the mentioning over in chapter 1 of where it says in verse 27, God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Okay. However, you have in chapter 2, God uh, mentions in... Uh, let's see here. Verse seven, the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed in the nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. You have in verse eight, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Um, and also in verse nine, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So then you have God giving Adam the commandment in verses 16 and 17. Then, verse 18, you have God saying 
It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meat for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meat for him. So then, verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. So, the question is, did he in fact do this event in Genesis chapter 1 on day 6, or did he do this, putting Adam to sleep, taking the rib out, did he do it after he gave the commandment to Adam to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Um, you apparently agree with Lisa. Lisa seemed to think that it was on day six. I think that it was after that and after God gave the commandment to Adam to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because my thing is, I don't know how Eve, well, how can I say this? We don't have a record that Eve actually heard God say or give the commandment to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We only have God saying it to Adam. He said it to Adam. Then Adam names all the animals and during that process, God, see, God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him help for him. Then he causes him to go to sleep. And after that, God creates Eve, brings her to Adam. They two are joined together and they're one flesh and they're both naked in the garden. And I think when the devil sees that, that's when he decides to approach Eve and go to her to try to get her to break the commandment instead of Adam. Now, does it matter? Apparently not, because God doesn't give us specifically the exact day when he created Eve. So, should we split the church over it? No. Should Sterling and I get into a big argument over it? No. Should he make a YouTube video? No. Sterling would make a YouTube video anyway. There's pictures of Sterling, and he never looks at the camera, ever. He's just not a camera guy. But it's just one of those things that's interesting. Thought I'd bring it up. Um, so anyway, but the idea is, here's when grace is manifested. Eve has disobeyed God. She's given that fruit to Adam. Adam has disobeyed God. All right? So, we have disobedience. We have God now having to enforce the law that he gave to Adam. And that was, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we know, uh, let's see, in verse 7 of Genesis chapter 3, the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They tried to cover up their own shame. This one act, I think, represent, represents mankind's decision to try to cover up his own sin. And since this time, man always tries to cover up his own sins. How many cover-ups do you think people in our government have made since the formation of our government? How many sins and crimes have elected officials, judges, presidents, congressmen, senators, governors, mayors, county executives? How many cover-ups do you think elected officials have, have instituted or made because they did something wrong and tried to cover it up. We had our own governor, Governor Greitens, 
thrown out of office. Well, he wasn't thrown out, but he resigned before he was thrown out because he committed a crime and they were, they were fresh on him and was going to prosecute him over this. They, in fact, had a grand jury indict him and he was caught trying to cover these things up. Man tries to cover up his own sins, his own unrighteousness. How many church people try to cover up their own sins? How many preachers cover up their own sins? How many people that are lost in this world, even, even when they think I can do whatever I want, and yet they still try to cover up and hide their own sins, their own transgressions. So here is God stepping in, in Genesis 3.21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. This was the first time I believe that grace is manifested in the world. Man's covering up his own sins, his own, the shame of his nakedness. And so God now realizes and says, this is insufficient. This is not good enough. This won't do. So God himself has to clothe Adam and Eve. Second Corinthians chapter five, turn there. I have it up on the screen, but I want you to look at it in your Bible. Second Corinthians chapter five. Five, four, three, two, one should be there. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. It's our desire to not ever be found naked. God has put it in us in every, he put it in every child. A desire at some point when a child gets to a certain age, all of a sudden now they don't just come out running out of the bathroom naked. They don't want to undress or be unclothed in front of people. That's in their nature. It is Something that just occurs to them, maybe at different ages, but they want to be clothed upon. That, to me, shows that there is a shame that is associated with sin. That's where that comes from. Before Adam and Eve transgressed, they were naked and they had no knowledge of it. They didn't care. Now, and you think about it. Before they sinned, there was nobody else in the world. After they sinned, there's still nobody else in the world. But now, all of a sudden, they realize they're naked, and it's in their mind, in their conscience, it's in their DNA. They want to be clothed. They want to be covered up. There's something about that. Even though they've seen each other, they want that covering. They want that cloak. And God grants it to them by His grace. So, verse 3 2 Corinthians 5, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. There was something, I'm just now remembering this. I remember that at some time in... King Saul. Saul was, when, when Samuel first anointed him, God put his Holy Spirit on him. And Saul prophesied. And it was said, is Saul among the prophets? Because he was prophesying, he was preaching. But then after Saul's rejection of God's word, the Bible says, Samuel said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee from being king. So at some point after Saul's rejection, God took his spirit away from him and an evil spirit fell upon Saul. There was a, a digression then in Saul. He's not, he's not getting better, he's getting worse. And at some point, I can't think of the, of the exact scripture where it is, but at some point, 
Saul even removes his clothes and he is naked and he's also prophesying. He's prophesying naked in front of everybody. Something has happened in Saul's mind and in his heart. God has taken that spirit away from him and Saul has an evil spirit on him and now he's digressing removing his clothes and prophesying naked and thinks nothing of it. Believe it or not, there was, I'm trying to remember in my notes, a church that did a sermon series called The Naked Church. It's one of these hip-hop coffee shop type, seeker-sensitive, Rick Warren type churches where... They're out there trying to shock everybody to get attention so that people will come to their church. They'll have sermon series and show two people in bed together or four feet sticking out the end of the covers. And they'll put that on a big billboard and they want everybody to come to their church. What they're doing is you're, they're using lasciviousness in order to draw people to the church. And so this church did a sermon series called The Naked Church. And of course they had billboards and they had leaflets going out all over the community and big ad in the paper. They're trying to draw people into that church because sex sells. And that's what they were trying to do. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You've heard me talk about the other translations like the NIV where it says the fine linen is the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And the Bible's telling you that it was granted. It was given to her just like God clothing Adam and Eve in the garden with coats of skins, meaning that an animal sacrifice was made. An animal had to give up its life so that Adam and Eve could be clothed upon. This was God then providing, taking something that was innocent and granting that then to cover up the sins of Adam and Eve. And that's what you have in Revelation 19. To her it was granted. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is given to her absolutely free of charge. Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Ephesians 4.24, that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I don't know if I have that in my notes or not. No, I don't. Here is the last of the seven churches that John is writing to. And um, he says to the church of Laodicea in verse 15, Revelation 3, 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. And have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and what? Naked. So he says in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold. Try it in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, which is what we see in Revelation 19. It's uh, fine linen, clean and white, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and that thou anoint thy eyes with Isab that thou mayest see. God granting to Adam and Eve, God granting to us, the believers, his grace in that now instead of us being naked, we are clothed upon with Christ. We're clothed with Christ's righteousness, uh, with God's goodness instead of our own. So this is the first time I see that grace being manifested in the Bible. 
Now here's the first time grace is mentioned. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Um, what did Adam and Eve do in order to receive that clothing from God? They didn't do anything. God granted it to them. God himself clothed them. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, there's, I have another story in my mind in Ezekiel chapter 16. Where God sees Jerusalem. And he's talking about Jerusalem. He talks about Jerusalem as his bride. And he says, I saw you when you were first born and you were cast away. And God says, I took you and I washed you clean, cut your umbilical cord off, and then I clothed you, then I adorned you, and I bought you fine jewels, and I put an earring of gold in your ear, and I put a necklace on you, and I, I gave you all this beautiful clothing for you to wear. God adorned Jerusalem. And then what did Jerusalem do with all of that that God gave her? Went out and harlotted herself with it. So... Here's the first time grace is mentioned. Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. Let me ask a question here. Does this mean that God made a mistake when it says it repenteth me that I have made them? Does this mean that God made a mistake, that God shouldn't have made man. No. It doesn't mean that God made a mistake. So, I'm going to throw another question out to you. What do you think it means when it says, it repenteth me that I have made them? What do you think it means? That's a big one, isn't it? Got any ideas? Cubby, do you know? Got any ideas? Broke his heart. That's a good one. Repentance always accompanies grief. It grieved God. Now, did God know that man was going to turn out this way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? So then, God's not saying, I made a mistake, I should have never made man. The use of the word repentance here, repentance, usually in the Bible, it accompanies the word turn. A change in course. So, repent and turn. Repent and uh, confess your sins. Usually when there's repentance... There is an action that follows that. And whenever you see God repenting, he's not, number one, admitting guilt. He's not admitting a mistake. And he's not saying to mankind, I'm sorry for making you. What God is signifying in where it says he repented, that, it made, that he uh, repented of me that I have made them. What you see then is God at that point is now going to change and alter what he's doing. That's what that signifies. God is not going to allow this to continue. God is going to now alter and change what he's going to do. And he does it at this point. So it says in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now I like this because... When you find something, normally it's because you're looking for it. Noah was looking for grace. Was Noah a sinner? Absolutely. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. 
So we know that Noah was not absolutely a perfect and a just man who had never done anything wrong. But we also know that Noah feared God. And he respected God. And so he looks for grace and he finds it in the eyes of the Lord. So in verse, uh, that was in verse 8. So we know then that after that, um, we have the generations of Noah in verse 9, 10, 11, 12. God looked upon the earth and it was corrupt. Verse 13, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So again, I think the word repent here has everything to do with God at this point is now going to put a stop to the iniquity and the unrighteousness of man. If you look over in Genesis 11, Genesis 11, verse 5. We know that the whole earth has one language, one speech, and they're all gathered together in the land of Shinar, and they're going to build a city and tower, its top may reach into heaven. In verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children and men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of the earth. My point is this, at Genesis 11, when God once again sees everybody coming together, and he sees their imagination, how they think they can build a city and a tower whose top is going to reach all the way up into heaven, God then puts a stop to that. He alters that course of mankind and changes what he's doing. These changes are all built into the plan of God. God knew it beforehand, but it's at this point then that God does that. Uh, back to Genesis chapter 6. Good morning, y'all. Genesis chapter 6. So God says in verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark. And what kind of wood is gopher wood? Anybody know? Huh? There's a theory. I'm not sure that cedar would hold up. There's a theory. And it's just, a, again, I'm bringing up all these things that since God doesn't say anything, it's not that big a deal. But to me, it's interesting. There's a... Because nobody, really, there's no wood. I mean, nobody goes to a gopher tree. Okay? But what do gophers do? Huh? They cut them down. They use their teeth and they cut them down. So there's this theory that says gopher wood is wood that has been cut, measured and cut, so it can be used to build this ark. In other words, don't just knock the tree down, or, or don't just go get dead trees. Go for the wood. Do what gophers do with the wood, and that is cut it so you can use it. Just a theory, but I like it. Makes sense. Uh, anyway, verse 18, so he tells them to build the ark, and then verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant. Underline that in your Bible. With thee will I establish my covenant. When God gives mankind a promise, he does so by his grace. Judicially, God does not have to allow that. So let me bring this up. Judges in this country are given the power to forgive the offenses of certain people. In other words, the president can pardon someone. We know that's in the law. But we also know that judges, I had this happen. I got a ticket one time. I was driving way too fast. I thought the speed limit was higher than it was. That's not an excuse. Driving way too fast. 
They gave me a ticket. I had to show up for court. Couldn't just pay the ticket. They said, you got to show up for this one. And I went, really? It's that bad? And the judge asked me what I was doing, and I told him what was going on. I won't get into the whole story. But the judge then, on the bench, decided to have mercy on me. And he said, I'll tell you what. Don't get another ticket for a year. I will suspend this. Don't get another ticket for a year. And if you do that, then this will go away and it'll be as if you had never done it. Justification. Amen. So guess what I did? I didn't speed for a year. Okay. I'm not saying I haven't since then. I just didn't do it for a year. I was very careful going through Hillsboro. My point is this. The judge made the decision to give me another chance. God is allowed to do that. There's nothing in the law that prohibits God from having mercy on somebody. In fact, God says, I will have mercy on who I have mercy, and I will pardon who I pardon. God makes the decision all the time to look upon people and grant them mercy. I want you to think about it. There are some very bad people in this world. And I mean very evil, bad people. God is allowing them to live. God is allowing them to breathe. God is allowing them to work and earn money. God is allowing them to just continue on in life even though they've done terrible, bad things. Now, at the end of life, that is the cutoff point. If a person continues in their transgressions to that point, God will, of course, judge them. Do not let anybody, anybody tell you that after you die, you get another chance. You've already been given other chances while you're alive. Amen? Those whom are smart take God's offer of grace while he offers it. And they don't just sit around and wait. Hopefully, after I die, I heard somebody on the internet say that I'll get another chance after I die. If that's what you're holding on to, you're an idiot. Somebody say amen. I'll establish my covenant, uh, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wives with thee. This is God mentioning, God manifesting grace to Noah for nothing other than he chose to pardon Noah. And did God choose the right one? Absolutely. Noah built the ark. And God knew that. God knew he would. That's why God chose him. So it is God's election. It is God's grace. But Noah found that grace in the eyes of the Lord. Interesting Sunday school time. We've talked about things that are not even in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for having mercy on your people. Thank you, God, that up until the day that we surrendered to you, you gave us grace Every day. You freely pardoned our transgressions and our sins. You let us live long enough until we reached out to you and submitted ourselves to you and received your grace and mercy. And Father, we thank you for that. We ask, dear God, for your pardon, for your grace, for your help, for your mercy, God. And we thank you, Father, that it is free to those of us who call upon your name. My prayer today is that somebody somewhere would call upon the name of the Lord. And God, that you would have mercy on them. God, you would manifest grace in their life so that they could be freely pardoned from all their transgressions and their iniquities. Father, we thank you for the word. We ask you, Lord, you bless that word. Teach us some great things today. Carry us on through this week. Bless the morning service, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.